Hi, Patrick. Thank you so much again for joining us today. Um, really happy to have you. I got to ask, like we just asked uh, our audience, what is your favorite coffee shop? If you drink coffee, if not, what do you drink in the morning? Um, I do enjoy my coffee. And the one place that I do, I don't go often uh, because of the price, but where I like to indulge myself is in Brentwood at Cafe Lux, right mm -hmm. at the Brentwood Country Mart. And if I'm ever within, let's say, a mile of it, I do make a point of going in. It's simply the best $5 Americano you could ever get. I'll have <laughs> <And> to go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, please, t Patrick, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Uh, I am an architect, contractor, and interior designer certified and licensed in each one of those fields. Um, I'm a currently adjunct professor with UCLA Extension teaching interior design courses. And along with that, I have my own practice um, where I do the architecture, the construction, and the interior design. Um, my office, I've got a staff of two people, uh, quote unquote, air quotes, in the office these days. And I've got three guys out in, as my crew out in the field to help me accomplish everything that we're attempting. Um, background, I've uh, been doing this for well over 25 years. Started off in architecture. Uh, my very good friend um, early on in our career joined forces and we created a design build firm doing the architecture and the construction. Um, recently, he and I separated and did our own, are doing our own thing, essentially the same thing, but separately, and which is where you find me today. ADUs are so popular and hot right now. Why, why do you think that is, or what are you seeing out there? So I think well, the primary reason, which I think is pretty obvious to everybody, is this is a source of additional income for anybody who's a homeowner, especially in Los Angeles, these sing Los Angeles with these single family residences as properties. Um, it's easy to convert, relatively easy to convert a garage, add on a space, um, or do some other kind of modification to the property to get this accessory dwelling unit. So it's, it's low hanging fruit in that respect. And so the income is one. The other one is there's a lot of multi-generational housing taking place in LA, I mean, all over the country. And the ADU formula uh, provides these families to extend their lives with their intimate family members for longer. You know, they get to do the multi-generational, they get to help their older family members have a nice safe place that are within this nice pod. Um, and they save some money while they're doing it. Is there a reason why they're moving more towards ADUs over like home extensions, for example? Um, because it's completely independent of the house. They can actually treat it any way they want. It could be a flop house for family members coming to crash during the holidays. It could be a short-term rental for someone visiting from out of town. It could also be long-term rental for a college student or for a single parent or just an individual. So sure. rather than adding it onto the house and giving whoever's going to be there access to the main house, it does keep it separate. For those that are uh, interested, you know, for new new clients that are reaching out to you, are, is there certain things that they need to think about before hiring an architect or a contractor? Um, in terms of starting the process? Uh, number one, hire an architect before a contractor. That's first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Someone that's been educated, trained, and has experience within the local jurisdiction to navigate the building department. Not to pull the permit, because that's easy. You just pay a fee and pull the permit with your name. It's to obtain the permit and make sure that whatever is being presented is compliant with the local zoning code. Um, so I think that's that's a big one. The second one is have a really clear understanding of what your budget is, what your length of time is that's comfortable for return on the investment, because it is a substantial investment to do what it is they're asking us architects to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other is be patient and tolerant of the entire process. It's not something that happens overnight. There's a lot of navigation, a lot of negotiation with the city and between client and architect. Um, and there's budgetary things that you have to fine tune. And then add to it the build, 
you've got a project that could be well over a year from start to finish. Um, so the third part of it is when you do hire the architect, make sure it's someone that you get along with because you're going to be with them for a very long time. No, that's really great information to know. How are people finding you these days? Is it word of mouth? I don't do any marketing. I haven't marketed in several, many years. Uh, we did a local publication, but it was very specific and direct to like a certain population. So it wasn't like Yelp. It wasn't like doing something on what we used to be Yahoo or something like that. Um, but it's all word of mouth. Everything is a referral from a past client, neighbor to a client, um, or the tradesmen that I work with. You know, so it's I like to view it as a big family and we look out for each other and anything that comes our way, we stay in contact and provide leads that way. But yeah, all referral. Yeah. And just to let you guys know, we will have Patrick's information uh, at the end, all the architects, if you do want to reach out and get more information. Patrick, are there any crazy asks that you are seeing with, in terms of the ADUs that you are working on? Um, any obstacles or solutions out there? Um, the, the biggest, and it's not really crazy, it's just ambitious. Uh, when it comes to an ADU, um, I would say the majority of the ones that we see happening, obviously, are the ones where it's a garage conversion. And they don't want to, they being, you know, the client may not want to spend, it may not have to be in their budget to add square footage to their garage to make it a larger, comfortable dwelling unit. So they build with, within what they have. Mm -hmm. So you end up having a 350 square foot living space, which is pretty small. And the, the asks that I get are, I would like something that resembles a separate bedroom, a separate kitchen, an enclosed bathroom with a tub, and a living area. And like those are four things within 350 square feet, and it's very difficult to pull it off. Yeah. Um, so, because they want it to resemble as much of a, as a, almost an apartment, but a dwelling unit, a living, livable space, not a college crash pad, bachelor pad. They want it to be more residential. Mm -hmm. um, that's one. The one, one of the more recent ones that I've got that we, I'm sure we'll look at was about soundproofing and coupled with the soundproofing this is a client where uh about a year and a half ago we started doing the design work and the construction on their adu it was a garage conversion we added a little bit of space to make it a fully enclosed one bedroom with a kitchen a bathroom and a living area and the idea was that they were going to move into the accessory dwelling unit which is still a plan while we build their house next door right on the same property it's a family of five wow. living in 538 square feet wow in one bedroom space that while we were building it the zoning code within that city which was culver city had changed based on newsom's ordinance that he signed allowing you within a small square footage in these accessory dwelling units to have two bedrooms and so now we've made out of the same footprint, we amended the permit and carved the one bedroom that was a modest, okay sized bedroom into two micro bedrooms for them. Yeah. So the parents could be on one side and the kids could be on the other. And for it to be completely legit, not to bootleg something in later on. So yeah. that was that was the the difficult challenge that took a while to kind of negotiate. But the other one on top of it was the soundproofing because he's a physician. He takes calls all the time and he wants to be able to be in any one of the rooms and close the door and no one can hear what he's saying or, you know, or he doesn't have to hear them. Yeah. So we invested in, you know, heavier, more substantial doors, improved insulation, the right kind of drywall, um, and then put in acoustic door sweeps. So when you close the door, the sweep comes down and seals the entire door. So there's no sound transmission through the seams. So that was probably the more, that was fun. That was a challenge. The more exciting one and the kind of craziest one. In terms yeah. Of I, 
and I was just thinking, you know, with garage conversions, how do you, I mean, have you been installing new windows or like opening up space to have that option? Um, or do they usually just, um, you know, break down the garage, I mean, where the garage doors open? I, I don't know. I'm just thinking, how, yeah. yeah, how do you work around that? So number one, the, it, or I guess it depends on the jurisdiction that you're in. Here in the South Bay, I'm in Hawthorne. They won't allow you to keep the big opening where your garage door is to turn it into giant windows or something. They want you to seal it up because they don't want it to resemble a garage after you're done. But other areas in LA, they're not as obsessed. They're not as kind of like crazy about that. So we've kept the opening, but before we do any finish work, we remove the garage slab, the existing one, and replace it with a new one that has proper vapor barrier underneath it. Otherwise, you get moisture coming up to the garage floor because it's not built like a house. So that's a cost that people never even consider. So there's the cost of new slab. Um, but so we'll do that. And then as far as the big openings, we'll punch windows in where we need to for a kitchen, for a bathroom. But more often than not, more often than not we try and take advantage of that large, already framed opening and put in you know, multi-slide doors, La Cantinas, you know, Marvin multi-slides. We'll put what we need to to fill it in so that it feels like it's part of the property rather than this little destination in the back of the property. It feels more conducive to outdoor lifestyle. That makes sense. Might be jumping around there, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's good information. Great to know. Yeah, I was just wondering I, for somebody who just... I, Obviously, I'm not an architect. I don't build ADUs, but uh, just for my knowledge and other people's knowledge out there. Let me share screen. This is the accessory dwelling unit for the family that's going to move in while we build our house. It looks bigger than it is because we vaulted the, the, the front facing facade of it. That's the main entry door. The big window to the left um, is the kitchen. And then to the right of the front door is the bedroom. This is the interior with the kitchen. So it's showing a galley kitchen. We wanted to create this as a space that was completely self-contained. Whoever's living there doesn't have to go to the laundromat to do laundry. We built in a laundry room within the kitchen. They have their sink, they have the range, the, the refrigerator. Um, in addition, this ADU is 100% electric. So there's no gas appliance within this building. And that's because that is where everything is trending. It's inevitable. Probably within the next five years, I would say LA is going to be making it mandatory, if not sooner, that every new construction be 100% electric. They're already doing it in Northern California. It's moments away from down here um, for any new construction. So this is all electric. And second project, the second project um, is the ADU I was speaking about that was within the shell of the existing garage. So this is 358 square feet. The previous one was 538. I didn't realize how similar those numbers were until just now. <laughs> uh, this 358 square foot, on the right-hand side, you can see the enclosed restroom. Where I'm standing taking this picture is the bedroom. Across from me diagonally is the living room. And behind this walnut shelf that we built, is the kitchen dining space. So we tried to confine, you know, keep everything within it. We closed up the garage door because where you see the front door in this was where the garage door was. Mm -hmm. Put in windows, put in a new door there. We vaulted the roof, put in a couple of beams, new posts to support the existing substandard roof to get it to do this, and threw in some skylights just to bring more daylight in because it is a very small postage stamp size structure. I really like the use of the shelves there. It's, it's a nice space. Yeah, a transparent screen that gives a sense that you're in a room, yet, you know, you do have that, the, the you feel like you're part of a larger space. It doesn't feel too constricted. For sure. And right now, she and her boyfriend are living in this unit and she's renting out the main house. Oh. So this is one where she changed, she flipped it for her own income. She built this, she can live in this, she can get more rent for the main house than she could for an ADO. So 
she's actually in the black on this, which is great. Like, so here's a, another shot of, from the front door, looking across the kitchen into the bedroom. And beyond, you can see the multi-slide glass door that we have, which is right adjacent to the bed. So when she is entertaining, she can open up the sliding glass door. Her bed becomes a piece of furniture for people to hang out on. But then she's got furniture out in the backyard of the garage to hang out with her friends and not interfere with the main residence. Very cool. And then the last one, which is a really small one, this is a junior ADU. So junior ADU, they have slightly different requirements, less restrictive requirements uh, than the main ADUs, the a primary ADU. So these ones, you're allowed to convert your garage if your garage is attached mm -hmm. and turn it into a living, a junior ADU. It does need a place to prepare food and a little refrigerator, but it doesn't require its own bathroom. So you okay. can actually have a door going into the main residence and they can share the bathroom adjacent to it. Oh, wow. So okay. The upside to this is cost-wise considerably different much more economical than the main ADU because you're not building a new bathroom. And the kitchen can be down to, like you see in this photograph, a simple sink with some cabinetry and a hot plate and an under counter refrigerator. And then you got storage, but then you turn the space into a, a bedroom living space for maybe the mother-in-law or some other family that are coming to crash and you don't want them in your business really enjoyable about it, this project and along with all of our my projects is always a collaboration with the client and this guy is an inventor and i think that's even on his business card and he just he loves to create things and we wanted to do everything we could to save costs on this so he did a lot of the labor himself i didn't do the build just did the architecture and helped him with the permitting process getting through the city and get it all approved um once we had it constructed, he had to get access through the garage door because he needed to have an exterior entry into this junior ADU. And he has what everybody else has on these garages in Los Angeles, a sectional garage door, four panels that roll up into the ceiling. We weren't allowed to use that as the primary door. Mm -hmm. They wanted us to put in a standard type of door with a minimal threshold. So he came up with this way of cutting out of the existing garage door, as you can see in the photograph, this sectional front door. So he can bolt it in place from the interior and the garage door rolls up like a sectional door. But if he doesn't want to open it that way, he just turns the doorknob and you can see it just swings open like a regular door and locks like a regular door. Wow. It's, it's pretty cool. He said he would never do it again because the prototype was just too difficult to pull yeah. off. Um, but I thought it was a pretty smart way of satisfying the building department's requirement to have its own entrance or point of egress. For sure. Yeah. So yeah, Very cool. those are the three. <laughs> Definitely an inventor. <laughs> awesome, Patrick. Thank you so much. Um, and we are going to open it up to questions and answers with Patrick uh, right after our next two speakers. Um, again, thank you, Patrick. And I know we're already getting some questions. Uh, I have some questions, um, but we'll uh, catch up with Patrick um, right after our next two speakers. Thank you, Patrick. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us again today. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, Alex. How are you? I'm fantastic. Struggling with our allergies, um, <laughs> but you know, I'm surviving. There are worst issues. So there are uh, worst there's, issues. <laughs> there's a couple of questions actually I wanted to start today with. Um, we have this poll going on. Maria, are you a coffee drinker or are you a tea drinker? Both. I do. I indulge in, in both beverages. Yeah. Awesome. And where's your favorite coffee or tea place to pick up? Oh, um, well, I live in San Francisco, kind of central, so lots of options, but my favorite is actually a bit of a one-off called Stable Coffee in the Mission District, but I have to say that there's a Pete's like two blocks away, and I probably frequent that most often, right. and it's just uh, your kind of local Pete's. 
So Maria, thank you for joining us again. Today we'll be discussing ADUs. Um, I wanted to take a moment. Could you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, I've been working um, for myself. And I'm a registered architect in California. Um, have been for 20 years, I guess. Um, and uh, I've been working for myself for about five, a little over five years. And prior to that, I was working at a firm um, for just about 17 years on commercial work. Um, and then as I started working for myself, I was getting more and more exposure to residential projects. And that uh, started to introduce me to um, this concept of accessory dwelling units uh, in particular. And so also here in San, and mainly San Francisco, and that usually involved um, uh, apartment, a couple apartment buildings, um, which wanted to add another couple units. Uh, there were also, uh, there was also a project that was the legalization of an existing unit, and that was in a two unit apartment building. And then we've had other examples of, of uh, the adding of a dwelling unit to what might be a single family home. So one of these Victorians or Edwardians here in the city, or a duplex style Victorian. And so those have, I've also worked on a few of those in the design and permit capacity. Awesome, thank you. Now I have noticed that I've seen a, an increase in plans for ADUs that come across my desk. Have you been seeing that as well? Or requests for a ADUs? Well, usually my, uh, clientele right now are mainly single family homeowners and so or in the other example it might have been um a property owner of an apartment building just uh, a single person who came to me or my colleagues who i work with um on some collaborations for example um they may ask about the potential for doing an adu so they either have it as an objective or there was like the legalization um, process that they were uh, wanting to pursue. But I don't, people come with the question and then we look at it relative to the property in order to evaluate it for uh, how conducive it might be. And then I'm usually the one developing the plans, but mm. yeah. Do you, um, why do you think that it's becoming so popular? What we're seeing is that there was probably around 2015 and around that housing crisis, some initiatives set up in the city that were trying to promote um, or encourage property owners to consider doing an, an accessory dwelling unit to add density to their property. And some properties which normally would have had some hurdles to uh, cross in order to do that, there's a waiver program, for example, that the, the city developed to try to um, facilitate homeowners to get to that finish line. And then um, I think it's just because there's also been a lot of pub publications about it um, really across the country, but mainly because I think it, it seems like something tangible for people to pursue, and it can be, but it's certainly still a process and a journey. And um, and and I would say that there's the whole enticement of a passive income, helping with your mortgage, um, you know, developing something that can expand your home for your kids or your, you know, the grandparents. All of those are great reasons and have been around forever. But I think what people are seeing is that they're if they're gonna do an improvement to their home, they might consider doing the extra effort of of going down the road of looking at developing a true separate dwelling unit at the same time. So <clears throat> I think we've spoken about this before. I'm, there's a lot of hurdles to cross whenever building an ADU. What is some information or what are you looking for um, when starting the process of 
creating the plans or drawings or even the concept of thinking of adding an ADU to a property? Um, well, it's a great question. So usually it, the first really important thing for any homeowner or, or property owner to, to consider is to really be sure about that objective because you are creating a separate dwelling unit. This is not a guest room. This is not a home office. Those are those are accessory uses to a dwelling. Ex accessory dwelling unit is intended to be its own separate dwelling unit. And so you're kind of taking on the position of becoming a landlord, in, essentially, in some ways. And so, you know, whether you might think of it as just for your in-laws or maybe for the kids coming home from college or whatever it might be, or you're going to move into this other unit as you grow older and maybe your kids move into the main house, whatever it might be, it's still a very, it's a distinct separate dwelling unit. So, um, so I think there's, a, and it's important for people to distinguish that versus like whether they're just looking for a family room. <laughs> and so, you know, because there's um to create that separate dwelling unit, the there's uh certain properties that are more conducive for that related to topography, uh related to what space is underutilized in your existing house that you might be able to recapture. Some require actual like horizontal extensions or vertical extensions. So there's the building of ab above and beyond what your current footprint provides. There's access to and from the street. There's fire department access. Um, Lots to in consider. Infrastructure. Infrastructure is a big <laughs> one because you're going to have a separate electrical meter, a separate water meter, um, fire suppression system potentially, and most likely. There's also, you know, just its own heating and cooling system or um, even excavation is another big one here in San, in San Francisco because um, many times there's likely to be the need for some excavation and new foundation systems, which, of course, then would, depending on the age of the home, possibly trigger some other seismic upgrades mm -hmm. that certainly add value to the property, but people may not think of those things when mm. they're simply picturing in their mind a simple studio. <laughs> yeah. So I've seen um, in the last few years um, working at BMD <clears throat> a lot of window wall applications, and now I'm starting to see them in ADUs. Are you seeing any trends like that or what types of you know, interesting or crazy trends or requests are you getting uh, from clients? I don't know if those are crazy requests. I think we've, I definitely have, um, because of, again, the properties that we have, which are typically uh, zero lot line um, on sort of the, the left and right, and you really just have a front and back condition to work within for fenestrations. Um, in some conditions. So you're really actually maximizing fenestration as much as possible. And that's where I was getting into a little bit of that excavation issue that comes up because you're trying to maximize in some, depending on the topography of that house, like what the conditions are on the back, because really you need that backyard or back exposure to be providing the uh, fenestration and egress and, um, just the quality of light to be uh, the to be primarily the the main source of light for the unit. So it is a bit of a of a concentrated effort on on maximizing those window walls because that's really the that's what makes it feel like you're not in a basement and you're not in a you know I mean there's no doubt about it. And so I really have done. Um, we have to go into excavation and really becoming almost like garden units really is what they become is so that that particular dwelling unit has a bit of an extension to the outside through the window wall system, but also out to the garden. And then of course they have proper access to the street, which is critical. So they have a, a, a proper egress and a proper access to the street. Um, but I don't crazy ideas. I don't think there really are that many crazy ideas. It's more um, 
just again that there's no one size fits all solution that I keep reminding folks. And um, there's just so many variables in design that are taken into consideration. Um, depends on each and every different property, different zoning districts, context, so many different variables. I would say probably the only thing that gets a little bit hairy again is excavation because it's such a big uh, endeavor that uh, um, people may not anticipate that if they're li if they have a basement condition, for example, a true basement and want to convert that to an actual separate dwelling unit. There's a solution for that, but it's not as easy as what we have as prototypes for the more conducive garage conversions. Mm. Yeah, basement condition, basement conditions, like true basement conditions are not there. There is a solution, but it, it's a more complicated one than um, than maybe what people think. And it kind of goes into my next question, which is what are some of the obstacles that you've experienced or you're seeing and then what are solutions? So I guess the basement is, is a great example of that. Well, yeah, if you have a true basement condition, that's that's not really like where again, that is like not what we think of as a prototype for what has been developed in the spirit of creating accessory dwelling units in a in a more pragmatic sense. Mm -hmm. it, that mm -hmm. is a much bigger challenge that would be requiring major modifications to how to get in and out of that type of environment and excavation. And, um, and so it's doable. It's just um, an undertaking that uh, is part of a bigger picture for, for a homeowner. So I, I think that they may want to consider a different, potentially a different objective um, yeah. if they have that kind of property. There's there's certainly examples of those basement like conditions depending on a sloping site here in San Francisco. We we it does come up. Mm -hmm. Yes. So my final question for today is um, because you and I both work in the Northern California market. <clears throat> what information does a homeowner or a contractor need to know about like the permits and the laws um, before starting? You know, I think my my uh, first and um, and main go to always is is the San Francisco for San Francisco again. Mm -hmm. um, San Francisco Planning Department has a really good website uh, that they've set up for providing some resources to homeowners that they can download and acquaint themselves with the process the um, the the initiatives and these programs that they developed um, to encourage or to take for Homer to consider doing this. So I always my first go to is the San Francisco Planning Department's website, not the building departments, but the planning department's uh, website. And they have a number of, of resources and documents related to both our our state and our local ordinances. Um, I think they're very they're they're far too nuanced to be able to get um, your head wrapped around all of them. It, it's it's pretty involved, but nevertheless, they've done a good job at trying to streamline it for people. And it, I use them as a resource all the time. And obviously, I work with those folks, um, uh, you know, one on one on projects, and so they're there to help um, and to try to be. Uh, answering questions when possible, but there's um, there's there are state laws that came into play even within the last couple years, um, and so I think you just um, uh, obviously has to go by jurisdiction. Unfortunately, it could be so nuanced that you can change a zip code and have something else going on. Mm -hmm. um, so really important to just get to the right starting place, which is usually your local jurisdiction, and hopefully they're going to get you on the right path so you're not going into some kind of 
cyclical pattern of mm -hmm. not getting the right information. Awesome. Right. So Maria, thank you again. Uh, really appreciate your time and your support. Um, next, we have Dalila speaking with Logan. So Logan, I have to ask, what is your favorite coffee uh, place? If you drink coffee or if not, what do you drink? Uh, I'd probably have to say any place that serves uh, coffee is my favorite place because I drink more than I should. Uh, first thing in the morning, that's what I do. And then uh, about halfway through the morning, I've probably had three cups by then. And then I always have an afternoon one. So any place that serves is good by me. And, and black with uh, just a Splash of whole milk is my favorite. That's how I drink it. So Logan, please tell us a little bit about your background. So uh, I grew up in Minnesota. I presently live in San Diego. I uh, graduated from Kansas State University in 2001 and moved directly out here to live with some old high school friends that I found out had lived here. Uh, I got a job in Encinitas, a small architecture firm that specialized in residential construction and I worked uh, there for 17 years uh, doing mostly residential and uh, and mostly North County San Diego residential projects uh, all side uh, all types of scales and sizes and uh, uh, styles and all that and then uh, in 2018 uh, my wife and I who I met at uh, my last firm uh, decided to start our own firm we did that for a couple of years. She's kind of taken that over as I've taken a uh, job as principal architect at the Brown Studio where I currently am. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we, the project types here are all over, but the, this also happens to be a mostly residential firm, uh, starting to get into development residential uh, projects or whatever. But uh, yeah, that uh, in a nutshell is kind of who I am. Yeah, no, very cool. So I, and I know that you have a lot of experience with ADUs, especially lately, right? With this this whole new uh, everyone working from home and things like that. Um, please uh, explain a little bit about your um, experience with that. Yeah, so, you know, a few, like right towards the end of working at the previous firm, uh, ADU started to kind of catch on, uh, or at least it was something that uh, the architecture side of things and, and the city planners knew that the state was cooking something up here uh, in order to address housing needs. Uh, in fact, in I think it was 2018, the, I was the president of AIA Palomar, which used to be the North County chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Uh, and at the time, it no longer is, they, they're now a section again, thanks to COVID, I guess. But uh, uh, anyway, at the time, in 2018, the president of AI San Diego, uh, his one-year term was focused on uh, this initiative he called Housing the Next One Million, in which uh, San Diego County, by 2050, uh, Sandag uh, did a study that says there'll be a million more residents to San Diego County and we're well under housed right now and it was kind of like how do we address this and uh, one of those solutions uh, i led the north county team and our solution for it was uh, what you know taking on the uh, the momentum that had already started with uh, adus and we you know explored all those and at the time i was still in you know, the state had passed the senate the first senate bill that uh, that introduced this but they hadn't uh, uh, you know, it's, it's since uh, progressed even further and, and become uh, more lenient and less restrictive. And uh, uh, from there, uh, you know, I'd say about 70% of the work that the firm, my wife and I, our firm, whatever, has been ADUs. Uh, and, that, and that went on, you know, steroids about June of uh, 2020 as, as, yes, people, I think, realized that uh you know if i got to be at home and everything and there's no place in the home to really be you know maybe i can do a, you know an adu as a as a sure the rental and all that but also as potentially a home office or something like that and so uh we've done probably i don't know in the last year and a half at least a dozen adus so some of them already built some of them you know getting permits others uh in construction but mm -hmm. uh yeah so that, you know, my wife and I have done a dozen. I probably did, was part of four to 
four to eight uh, prior to moving. And then uh, we're, we're working here in the ground studio to kind of uh, develop the marketing that uh, really you know, goes after ADUs as a, as a legitimate like arm of the business, you know. So as a client, uh, what kind of information do they need to give you in order to get this process rolling? Uh, typically, I like to do set up a consultation that, uh, you know, I, I'll field a phone call, a text, something like that, and I'll set up a, a mask to mask or face to face uh, uh, consultation at the site to just kind of see it. Uh, you can do a lot of research online, all the cities. I mean, if you just go, if anyone just types in the city they live in, assuming that that has their own uh, municipality and, and the permitting is not through their county or, or larger city, uh, uh, you can typically just type in that city's name and ADU ordinance, and every, all these jurisdictions have developed uh, pamphlets, if you will, that really break it down as to what you can and can't do. Um, and then from there, it's a good way to kind of educate yourself as a client uh, to speak to an architect, because then you, you know, there's a lot better understanding of what you can do and, and all that ahead of time. Uh, but then we can lay it out. Uh, there's always more information than just what the cities are putting on their pamphlets so and every site typically is a little bit different than the next so what worked for your neighbor you might have the same floor plan because you're in a development but your lot is slightly different and there's different uh, parameters there that uh, you know you could be across the street and then your orientation is a little bit different uh, all those kind of things you know uh, hiring an architect uh, can help you navigate that and provide you with the best solution uh, that's sure. out there. No, yeah, that it, that's actually some really good advice. Yeah, so I, I have some projects that uh, I can share that uh, range in. Uh, there's there's a few different uh, opportunities with ADUs. I think uh, for the most part, uh, a lot of people seem to be looking at these as uh, uh, as what I like how I like to refer to it as uh, they are putting the accessory and accessory dwelling unit. And by that, I mean that they uh, uh, you know, there's there's design opportunities that every every house or every property basically has that uh, might be specific to that family, specific to that lot or whatever that aren't necessarily, you know, in the the, the kind of uh, guidelines or whatever that the or the intentions that were set out by the by the state, but the the municipalities and the state don't have problems with that. You know, it's kind of that's uh, again an incentive to. Uh, I'm going to share the screen here. I don't know. Okay. Um, there's incentives to uh, to develop your own own uh, uh, functionality, own aesthetic, etc. Uh, this project here is an ADU that uh, will be going in to get permitted. It's in Oceanside, and this is a perfect example of that. In that. Uh, uh, this owner doesn't necessarily need to rent out a space, but uh, he's he's in the process of remodeling uh, or renovating their backyard, which currently is just a, you know, wasteland of sorts or whatever. And part of that was that he would like to add uh, an accessory dwelling unit that, you know, would have the potential to rent should he need to, but ultimately serves as, as a... Um, uh, you know, an accessory to his house, you know, something that when entertaining or just there with his own family, uh, uh, just an opportunity to go and uh, enjoy something there. So this here is a floor plan. Uh, as you can see, most accessory units wouldn't have a, a pool table or design a round pool table, which we spent a lot of time doing here. Also to keep it within this thousand square foot uh, uh, number, which uh, affords us the ability to bypass uh, the underlying zone uh, development standards and provisions that uh, the state law allows you to bypass certain development standards uh, for these ADUs. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, uh, setbacks, like their rear setback is 20 feet, which is, this is over here, and they're, they're able to go as close as four feet to that setback, uh, as long as they keep it a one-story building. But, so that's the floor plan uh, here. You know, again, custom design. Uh, this is a galley kitchen with a giant window facing out to the dining table, which is just something that they, this homeowner, you know, doesn't mind having the galley kitchen, you know, really actually wanted the galley kitchen just so they'd have this ability to stand at the grill and, uh, or the range, you know, and, and cook yeah. for friends and family. 
uh galley kitchen i think is what it's uh, typically referred to which basically just means that it's like a hallway you know it's it's uh, yeah. as opposed yeah. to your typical l shape or you know an island or something like that it, it's just it's very narrow here it's uh five foot six across so two feet of that is the counter you only have like three and a half feet beyond that uh but that's what they you know this is what this client wanted and um and again, this is just a good uh, example of of what an ADU doesn't necessarily have to follow this kind of rigid, like boxy, 800 square foot, one bedroom, just slap it up and all that. Like you can really use uh, ADUs as an opportunity. I mean, renovating a home is uh, is expensive and homes are typically a lot bigger than say 800 or in this case, a thousand square feet. Now, sometimes they're not. Uh, but uh, either way, it, it might require, you know, redoing a lot of infrastructure and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, well, you know, having the ability to, you know, start from scratch uh, and design your, you know, almost your dream home in a sense, but that's a smaller footprint or whatever meets the requirements for these ADUs with respect to area uh, square feet is, is kind of an interesting uh, uh, opportunity or whatever I've had to, uh, this next project is actually a small project, but the but what the intentions are from the homeowner's perspective, I don't have renderings of it, but um, this project here just shows a demolition plan, a floor plan of what, this is a uh, 2,500 square foot single family residence in Carlsbad that has a three car garage and they're going to convert this, this uh, this third car garage space and add on to it in this uh, linear fashion here and the homeowners here they're retired uh you know they don't they're not having their income is fixed uh they're actually going to move into this house that they you know or adu that they're they're you know designed exactly to the parameters that they wanted uh and then they're going to rent out the main house and uh you know the mortgage will more or less be covered by the rent of the main house and they don't have to worry about that anymore and they can be live on site and you know uh, property manage their own house that they still own uh from uh, from the comfort of their own little adu on site uh, so that too is is kind of that's how i'm relating it to the other one it's just there's a lot of opportunity to, to uh, from a homeowner's perspective uh, as to what an adu can be uh, and i think that uh, uh that would be my reason to going to an architect and presenting your ideas and whether or not you think they're outlandish or crazy or whatever uh, i doubt it i mean that's what we we've heard and envisioned and thought of everything ourselves so i don't see it as uh i just think it'd be you know it's a really good op opportunity to take your existing lot uh, and or house or whatever and and kind of treat it like it's brand new uh with respect to uh what you can do there uh just since i have the pictures i'll just show you a couple other uh this is a this is one that we completed before they increase the size of adus uh it's 640 square foot uh which used to be the maximum allowed in carlsbad uh, for an attached adu and this was just built over an existing garage you can kind of tell what yeah. the existing house must have been uh, and then another one in, in Carlsbad that we're in the process that they've just gotten the permits approved is this is the existing garage and then, you know, we're building right over the top of it. Uh, and, you know, again, this, this, the homeowner here intends to move into this and rent out the primary residence because it'll be a means to basically living on site with a brand new building for free. Uh, Logan, those are awesome. I, from your opinion, what do you think? Um, I mean, for what you're seeing out there, do you think most homeowners are, you know, building ADUs because they're, you know, they're moving in, into them, or is it, you know, maybe for budget reasons? Or what do you think are the main things you're seeing? Are you seeing just a little bit of everything? I think right now the the majority of people are are doing it with, or at least getting into it with the intentions on supplementing their income in order to, you know, reduce, you know housing costs are just so high or whatever and if you can just with interest rates the way they are if you can get a, a cheap loan build one of these out and then start collecting two grand a month uh you know it, it it's a no-brainer kind of a thing so uh, i think that's driving a lot of people at least their their initial interest and in, in their engagement 
-hmm. However, I think that uh, once people are getting into it and kind of starting to realize some of the things that I was talking about, I think they're actually thinking more of like, you know, cheap debt is all right. And uh, it'd be kind of fun to have a brand new something on the, you know, like instead yeah. of reworking the whole house in order to get one room to be nicer or whatever, it's like, you know, just leave the house. And I, I think people are ending up exploring the notion of, you know, unless they're a family with kids and all that, but uh, uh, couples that, uh, or individual owners that uh, don't have family or don't have to, to concern themselves with, with those kind of things are, are really looking at it as an opportunity to move into downsize right on site and then renting out their primary residence or whatever. I think that's uh, ultimately what's happening through the, through the process of developing designs and talking about what the opportunities are and, and exploring those opportunities for the uh, specific site. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, it, yeah. it's starting one way and ending up another, but uh, there still are plenty that are just doing it to get something on site and supplement the income to, to reduce their mortgage payment, uh, if not for eliminate sure. it in some cases, you know. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, do you... Do you find that there's any like obstacles that you're dealing with on a daily basis that maybe it's the homeowner forgot to tell you something or they add on? Do you have any of those kind of obstacles that it'd be good to know beforehand? I think, uh, I mean, in all honesty, the obstacle, the only obstacle we've really come across is just that these these ought to be the, the state and the, the, the rules, laws, codes that have been written have done their part to expedite this potential. But the, with COVID coming and, and a lot of these cities not just weren't ready to uh, address work from home or, or digital submittals and all that. So processing of these plans, even though they, they wrote all the rules that said these, these processing should go fast, it was written without knowing that the city staff would be working from home and there'd be all this, it's kind of a log jam when it gets there which kind of stinks for the uh, homeowner who's so excited and ready to ready to get this last step done and then start the construction process. But uh, I envision that that'll clear up, you know, as 2021 moves along. But uh, other than that, there's there's not a lot of things. They've, they've made it pretty straightforward as to what you can and can't do. Uh, certainly there's every, you know, the, the straightforward lots that have a street in front and a property in the back and on each side are are easy to understand, but there's a lot of uh, randomly shaped lots and things like that, that you might, you know, that you, again, it's really, you know, that's uh, even more reason to go to an architect or someone who, and, and preferably someone who has experience, at least within that jurisdiction. Uh, even if they haven't done an ADU yet, I mean, they're in another few years, every architect will have at least done one ADU the way things are going. But uh, there were some that, you know, hit this up a little sooner than others. And then because of that have been the referrals to keep going to them and all that. Uh, and certainly there's uh, manufactured uh, ADUs uh, being marketed on the web and things like that. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity out there. I just, uh, you know, I'd advocate for hiring an architect, a local architect, uh, even if you've got to interview a few or whatever to find the one that you just uh, mesh with, but, uh, and really exploring what, I mean, it's it, it, it's the the limitations are are very minimal. So it's like really whatever you come up with, uh, uh, for the most part, the you know just following the very basic uh, development standard guidelines there, and you can really do just about anything because uh, the state needs these built. Uh, at the end of the day, they need as many of these built as soon as possible, uh, just to at least attempt to address the. Uh, housing and needs that uh, the whole state need has. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Logan, so much. I am pretty impressed, especially with that kitchen, how it's like it saves space, right? And I think like ADs, yeah. you can be a little bit, um, you know, creative on like where you're gonna, you, where you're gonna put this, put things, right? So I, yeah. mean, I would have never thought of having a kitchen there. Was that a request, or was that kind of a suggestion from you guys, or? Um, the it it kind of was a culmination of two. Like he kept uh, whittling thing or enlarging the bedrooms and whittling down the kitchen. But at the time, the way the kitchen was laid out, it just was making it for an awkward kitchen. So then it became like, why don't we just treat this as if it's you know almost like a uh, what is the the 
a food truck kind of a thing or whatever, you know, yeah. and just like literally if you're, if the whole reason for this is simply to prove you already have a kitchen in the house. So this really is kind of functioning as a show off piece for when you have friends out in the yard and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, but yeah, that was, that was fun. It was almost like whittling it down was, you know, the best thing that could happen because then it, it resulted in this, which he loves. And, uh, I think it's pretty cool. I wouldn't, I, I normally don't do renderings like that. If, uh, uh, if I'm not really, you know, a fan of it myself or whatever. So, yeah, I definitely think it's a pretty cool thing, too. Logan, thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, we're going to uh, open it up to questions and answers uh, next. Okay, so I get to be moderator for this. My name is Terry. I'm actually with the marketing side of BMD. And we do have a couple of different questions that have been posed. Um, the first one actually has to do with um, what's the range of square footage for ADUs? And is there a maximum allowable? So if any of our panels would like to uh, jump in on that, it'd be great. Oh, I'm uh, an answer. Or, okay, I'll, I'll make my answer brief, but it does depend on the jurisdiction and with the new ADU ordinances that are out, it's about 1200 is the maximum. Uh, but more importantly, the ADU cannot be larger than your main residence. So if your residence is 800 square feet, you're not allowed to do a 1200 square foot ADU. You have to make your ADU smaller than the main residence. Okay. And then we also had another question, which is, um, is there any difference in permitting requirements depending on if the ADU is going to be for personal use or if it's going to be a family member? So family member versus, um, you know, an income source. Um, I will throw out that the only difference there, there's nothing with, as it relates to the building department or any kind of permitting, the big driving force is if it's going to be for personal use or renting, it might impact your attitude towards budget. Are you going to indulge on the finishes and materials and the build out for a tenant? You would probably prefer to do that for yourself. So I think making the decision if it's for yourself. You might be willing to spend a little bit more money if it's for a tenant. You might want to save a little bit of money so you can get that return on the investment a little bit sooner. Okay, and um, we have one. Uh, do you find that ADU plans have some cities that are there like a pre approved plans um, or is it does it become an issue when consulting with a new client? I can uh, answer that Patrick, give you a break there. <laughs> I was trying to answer the last one and couldn't get my mute button to unmute. <laughs> um, uh, there, I'm familiar, at least on here, there's uh, the city of Encinitas uh, got two different architects, one being my old boss, uh, to develop some plans that uh, are their permit ready ADUs. Uh, and, uh, there's been some interest in them, I, but I think that uh, ultimately, Every lot, like uh, like I was saying earlier, and it's been said by others, uh, every lot just has its own opportunity or whatever. I don't know that the permit ready ones ultimately because processing is, uh, and they're permit ready, but they're not permitted. Uh, so, and same with the manufactured ones, or whatever. I don't I don't know that there's a, uh, you know, that it's ultimately that better to do it, but uh, th they are available. Okay. And probably just because we're getting pushed for time, if anybody would like to type in questions, we can always answer them offline. But the last question we have, and I know this is gonna vary a little bit, um, county by county, state by state, but how does an ADU affect property taxes um, in general? What does that normally do to, to uh, property tax of for someone if they do it in an ADU? I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah, I I don't I don't either. I just know that your property is going to be reassessed at a higher value because of the improvement. Um, that's about as far as my knowledge goes with that. Perfect. Well, um, Delila, those are great questions. You thank you, Terry, so much, and thank you all of the speakers. You guys did. Uh, it was very informative. Great job um, for all the attendees out there. We will be sending out a link to our presentation today and we will have 
we will announce our coffee drink winner as well. And if you guys have any more questions uh, for any of the attendees, please uh, feel free to um, reply to any of the, the email that we will send out with the link at the end of this webinar. So thank you again for attending. I appreciate it. And again, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to um, pop that into the chat or questions and answers below. So we'll leave it open for a couple more minutes, but if you um, if you have to leave again, thank you guys so much for attending. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Logan. I appreciate your guys' time. Thank you, Dalila, for um, a really good webinar. I enjoyed seeing um, and hearing from folks down in Southern California um, to those colleagues down there. Good to um, see you all virtually. Yeah, this was great information. Thanks to all of you for uh, taking the time to do this today. Yeah, it was a real pleasure. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed, as you said, Maria, it's nice to see the other colleagues from around the state participating in this and seeing and hearing the different views and attitudes. And also it's reassuring to hear that everybody's got a very similar experience when it comes to designing and consulting with clients on this. Great. So I think we're good. Terry, do you see any questions on your end? Um, there was one quick one. Let me find it real fast. Um, can you add an ADU above a garage if the garage is on the property line? And this is specifically Oakland area. So I think it, a pretty specific question. I And if I remember right, um, I don't, and I honestly don't remember if it was Patrick who answered this, um, that it <clears throat> lot lines actually can be a little bit different with an ADU than they can if it's just an addition. Is that correct? I don't know if it was, if it was Patrick or Alan who answered or Logan who answered that. Yeah, no, down here, um, you know, it's kind of a city by city as far as what the jurisdiction will will allow with re respect to development standards and setbacks and all that. But uh, the building code, uh, I would imagine, if it's right on the property line, that it's gonna you couldn't have any windows, uh, you couldn't have any openings, and it would have to be a rated assembly, uh, one hour at minimum, I believe. Uh, so uh, it's kind of a tough question. It's uh, I think it's possible, but um, yeah, that's another. Kind of reason to go to someone who knows uh, local rules and and just a, an architect is going to be the person to answer this question. Um, it's specific to the site. Perfect. I I just add if I could just you know put a footnote to it. Um, you won't be able to allow. You won't be able. To, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that you won't be able to do a two story ADU with a zero lot line anywhere. Um, but we've had some kind of creative approaches to ADUs that were in the backyard where the garage that was going to be converted or added onto wasn't in the right location. So we would tear the garage, we did it in two phases. We would tear the garage down, build a new garage that was on a zero lot line because we could, it's an accessory structure just for the, gar the cars. And with how forgiving these ADU ordinances are from, I'm in LA County, so all the cities that I'm dealing with, they're very similar in that respect. You can rebuild your garage zero lot line, convert it, and your ADU is on zero lot line after the fact. And if you add a garage, something on top of it, you do have to offset it from the property line to respect the neighbors. So um, I think to Logan's point, upgraded assembly is the right kind of, you know, windows not too close. If they are too close, you can't have a window on the property line. Um, it's, but to reinforce the idea, it does require talking to an architect because they're the ones that are familiar. We're the ones familiar with the, the ordinances, with the cities, interacting with them um, and coming up with these solutions. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you all of all of you guys again for joining us today. Um, if you need an ADU built, hey, we've just we got some three awesome architects that you can reach out to. Again, um, look out for that email. We will be sending out a link to our presentation today. And if you have any questions, again, um, look out for that email. Thanks again for everyone. And uh, we'll uh, see you at the next webinar. Bye.